Fall Robert Stach and Horde, who get Lorni Belladish and Podrail to get Knusok Belladis Aaron, Klosh and Hoskoda, Blah Ria. It's a great pleasure to be back for another edition of Blurney Belladish and uh, with myself, Johnny Dillon. And, and myself, oh yeah, sorry, I've just grief here. Sorry, you're all with the one that bought in. So too eager, it's been two months, Johnny, Good. I'm sorry. It has. Sorry. And Claire, for the sake of completeness, doing ahoy. Ahoy to you, buddy. Excellent. Delighted to, to be here. It's lovely to be back. It feels like ages. It has been ages. So we should send a wee note of thanks to far-flung listeners who have sent little notes inquiring to our existence it's or non-existence. It's been lovely to see if we're still alive and kicking. It has. And we are. Um, so yeah, we appreciate all the little notes that come from, from far-flung corners. It's lovely to know people are listening. It is. I'm sure. It, I just thought it was you pressing play all those times uh, it, all, on all, SoundCloud. Yes, that was, yeah. <laughs> So um, so thanks for, for your wee notes and, and so on. But to move to the, the focus of today's edition of Burnley Bell Edition, we're going to be discussing a creature that goes by many different names uh, and which in tradition is associated with learning and wisdom, like ourselves. Indeed. Which granted the hero, Phil McCool, his wisdom um, and granted our forebears likewise an enormous amount by way of economic reward, which we'll look at later, and was even emblazoned on the coinage of the Irish Free State in 1928. Yes, I remember those coins, but I bet certain younger generations now won't. They might not. They're bloody them. beautiful. Much nicer than today's. The old euro. <sighs> ah, it makes my travelling a bit easier. Oh, don't even get me started. <laughs> the, 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 the barnyard, Percy Metcalf, mm. made the coins with the, the animals on them. Well, they were, they were unique, certainly, they were beautiful. and they captured so much of Irish tradition exactly. and history. Yes. yes, they were totally beautiful. Um, however, the, what we're talking about today are the, 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 uh, the gentlemen of the deep, the noble salmon. From the supernatural, traditional customs and beliefs regarding the salmon, um, more practical concerns, economic concerns, fishing, poaching, hunting, um, then we'll look at some of the occult and symbolic associations of the salmon. Mm. And then we will also look at the popular, the, the, the motif concerning uh, Phil McCool and the salmon of knowledge and his thumb and so on and where that seems to come from and to link it into uh, the kind of Icelandic or the, the Norse tradition mm-hmm. and back into the into the Indo-European tradition as that particular motif. It's a good topic, I think. I, I bet people will see the salmon when they first see the podcast and think, oh, Finn McCool, here we go. Probably. But we hope we're going to dispel a few myths and maybe introduce you to a few more curious aspects of salmon in Irish lore and tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, should we start with the kind of material practical concerns? Yeah, just worth saying um, a note about it. I always tend to do the boring practical Nonsense. stuff but actually I, I like it's what i find most interesting in the kind of daily lived experience of people and um, from our forebears on down to our own generation but just a note to i suppose impress upon people how central fishing as a practice was amongst our forebears in ireland in that not only the individual and the family and the wider community but It was so heavily relied upon, not only for physical sustenance, but also economic sustenance. Mm. So you can see the nutritional value that we know today. We're all about our omega-3s and all the healthy fats. I had salmon last night. Um, I feel better for Mm -hmm. it. Um, So you've got your nutritional value for families. You've got then the economic value for um, fishermen who would have made their living. We have accounts in the... um, the annals of the archive if I can find it here there's one from a gentleman from County Kerry where he was speaking about I was 14 when I started fishing my father was a fisherman all belonging to me was a fisherman brothers and all there was fishermen and they were very superstitious which we'll come to but we just get that feeling of it being a family business generational thing absolutely from father to son Mm. grandfather onwards and backwards and it being the only livelihood that many families would have had in maritime communities um, along the coastlines and we'll see this kind of come up in how frequently the salmon appears in customs and beliefs all along the Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast as well it kind of charts the migration of the salmon so where people would have depended on it Mm. it appears again and again not only in the beliefs and the customs and the traditions but in the narrative tales Mm -hmm. as well so just to point out a few wee bits um, we have there's a wonderful chapter in an equally wonderful book by our own director mm. um, and Dr. Kristen McCarthy, who is the director of the Folklore Collection. And it is called Traditional Boats of Ireland, History, Folklore and Construction, which came out in 2011. And it, it's just it's amazing. Oh, it is yeah. just not only from 
the written articles, but the photographs, the photographs and is, the yeah. wonderful sketches. Mm. So it's well worth looking into. But there is um, an introductory chapter on Irish fisheries by Arthur Reynolds. And he has some great facts that I wasn't even aware of, just to kind of give a bit of a feel for the, the value of fishing industries um, in Ireland in the past. So he mentions that from around 1300 onwards, so popular and so plentiful were Irish seas that the Italians and the northern Spaniards were producing charts of our seas hmm. to get their fishermen over early and um, precursors to the old European Union mm -hmm. then we've got in the 15th and 16th century he speaks about at least 14 ports in Ireland that could be described as fishing centres with fleets that operated all year round um, if given kind of favourable weather conditions not always the case in Ireland he has a quote from the 1600 household accounts for Trinity College Dublin, which shows that on Lent and on Fridays, there was an absolute, an abundance, it just sounds like feasts were had, of salmon, oysters, salted fish and herring being the most common um, food substances. Mm -hmm. And then not only should we remember that it was important for our local communities internally and kind of nationally, but also we had a huge export market I suppose in that he quotes in 1641 526 tons of salmon were exported and mostly he says from the likes of Waterford and Wexford to British markets mm. so much so that British um, fishermen were giving out that their markets were being um, exploited and kind of overrun with Irish produce but that in itself to me I just kind of really brought it home how, how far away we've moved from that now with the challenges of kind of modern fishing quotas and, and climate change and, and overfishing yeah. but just how reliant our forebears would have been um, on these and not only on if you think of the fishing stock itself of the salmon but also you have to think of the ancillary um, networks and this ancillary products so you can't go fishing without your nets. You mm -hmm. can't go fishing without your boats. You can't go fishing without your, um, kind of, your baskets and your barrels to preserve them in. So all of these had to be made. All of these had to be created, and so therefore you had kind of people on the mainland, producing these. Mm. And also the wonderful I just wanted to touch on, although it's not directly applicable to salmon, but I just love the story behind it. There's such a thing as the herring girls. Have you ever heard of this? I've heard of them in Scotland. Yeah. Mm. So it's. Basically, if you imagine the herring, again, herring mackerel, salmon, hugely popular um, fish species to be farmed. And we have many samples and memoirs in our, in our archives of women becoming herring girls. So they would follow the migration of the um, fish, almost the herring in this case, from Ireland. And they would emigrate to Scotland in this kind of fishing season to do this, hmm. where they would work on the coastlines to kind of gut and skin and mm -hmm. prepare and salt the herring in order to send it off to market but um daniel o'donnell who is our, our wee daniel his mother actually in her memoir wrote a beautiful piece about being a herring girl hmm. in the shetland islands so these women this would be their their livelihoods as well and they would quite beautifully i, I say this romantically now i probably would have hated it but um they would have traveled with the migration of the fish to follow it all along the coast from southern england all the way up to scotland in hmm. the islands um, being herring girls and kind of salting, gutting and skinning these fish. There's um, Ewan McCall, the, what's it, Singing the Fishing, Radio mm. Ballad, 1947. It's amazing, absolutely amazing, where he'd had these recordings before the age of documentaries, but he'd had these recordings that he'd made um, with herring fishers and he followed, uh, some of them mentioned the, the, the girls who came to do the gutting and all this, and they're talking about their hands um, yes. splitting open from the brine and stuff Awful. like this as they went along. But... Um, but something you touched on there with the connection with with the connections with Britain, um, and even the the nets and so on and so forth, mm. um, there was a, a a lot of kind of crossover of even uh, fishermen from Britain traveling over to Ireland, particularly in Wexford and Dublin, and settling, and bringing with them um, crafts and trades and knowledge about fishing that ha that hadn't existed here. There's a piece from the Urban Folklore Project from from uh, 1980 here that I want to play from um, a fellow who was Lyrics Murphy. Who Lyrics was, Murphy. Lyrics Murphy. That was his name. That was his name. Yeah, um, so he's he's uh, he's discussing um, these fishermen who in eight in the early nineteenth century um, are unable to fish their native fishing grounds and they travel to Ireland and they settle at Ringsend, but they bring with them all this um, new technology and knowledge, basically. Travel started here. Now, uh, 
in a big way around 1830 when during the Anglo-French War uh, the people uh, uh, they were, we call them Tar Bays and Rings End they originated from a place called Tar Bay down on the Devon coast and they couldn't fish down on the English Channel during the Anglo-French War and they set sail with their families uh, up the Ordish Sea up the St. George's Channel into the Ordish Sea and they settled in Rings End and they were great people they brought a great culture of fishing net making boat building and uh, especially the fishing because they were experts yeah. at the fishing and uh, so that's Lyrics Murphy 1980 talking about the settlers from Torbay in Devon uh, to, to Rings End so you had the connection of kind of the coastal peoples of Britain and Ireland and the movements between them, Wexford, Cornwall, places mm. like Devon and so on, that there's a kind of an interplay, like an interplay and exchange of knowledge in the same way that you'd have, say, um, young men and women from Donegal going to Scotland and there's this kind of, I suppose, the connection of coastal peoples, mm. basically, of these islands. But were you saying something the other day about, about selling nets from Ireland or that the, oh, the, the yes. nets that were sold to Wales? Yes, yeah, it says here... The requisites of fishing, nets for fishing and salt for preserving were imported from Ireland, although during the 18th century crafts such as net and rope making and coopering developed in coastal villages themselves in Wales. Mm. So yeah, it seems that for um, a certain amount of time, nets were imported to Wales from Ireland. Mm. Do you want to cover um, more practicalities or do you want to move into taboos and things like that? Oh, I might just the... say a note on the old poaching if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Because I found something interesting in the school's collection, if I can find it here. So there's a gentleman from Cork who will remain unnamed Excellent. for the sake of avoiding um, defamatory accusations. And he is talking about um, a certain approach that they took to poison um, the salmon oh, in, we in order this. to yeah, draw yeah. them out. I'd never heard of it before. So basically, um, he says here, pell poisoning might be a crime, but tis done over and over. I'll tell you how they used to poison the rivers long ago. So I'm going to quote from him here. So um, I won't put on a Cork accent, but um, some of the, because it's written verbatim, it might just sound a bit peculiar. So it was the wheat called Buenikin they used to use. It grows in wild, rough places best. It used to be dug up by the roots and all. And in the roots, the best of the stuff is to be found. Something like thick milk when it is squeezed out. Um, and then they would dig bags of it and... Yeah, the old Cork accent kind of goes quite strong there. But basically, essentially what it is, is this herbaceous plant called the Buenikin, um, which I must look up the English name of it, that used to have the substance of this milky... Um, uh, you can imagine Poison. as a child that you, when you um, get the, the water out of certain plants, when you squeeze it, they would place this into the water by the pits where the salmon were um, spawning or returning to. And for whatever scientific reason, it would draw out the salmon mm. whether to kind of come out um, of their pits to get air or whether oxygen is removed from the water I, I'm not sure but it essentially draws them out into the clear water so that for the poachers it's easier to see them and then spear them and within that same account there is a wonderful depiction of the what drawing. it's called it is it's literally and um, one of the students has taken the time to draw um, a, sp a poaching spear and it says here that they called it a throy and it is essentially a, what does it look like? It looks a it's bit a like large a... large rake, I suppose, with not one, two, three, nine prongs, ten prongs. It is. Very, very wide. It is. It's so it's... Excellent for stabbing. Indeed. I might acquire one myself, mm, Johnny, mm -hmm, when you kind mm -hmm. of get too much for me. <laughs> but um, it's, the handle is wooden. It's eight foot long. Then, as Johnny said, it has nine teeth or nine prongs. Each of those is two and a half inches apart. And basically, it you can just imagine it's a stabbing um, action into the water Claire's doing a stabbing motion with the hand there as well just I often it do it you just don't see it Johnny yeah, yeah. Really behind me. so um, the, yeah poaching is you have to remember that you had the very um, legally respectful way of fishing <laughs> um, in rivers and on the open water and especially on rivers you would often have many descriptions about having to obtain a license mm -hmm. and we fish between certain times of year they finish at August 15th exactly. the season didn't it? yeah 1st of February to the 15th of August usually used to be the salmon season so you'd have licenses, you'd have water bailiffs observing that they mm -hmm. were um, obtained. Then you had the division of rivers for certain communities and how you would organise that. But then on the other side, as 
with all human life, you have those who might seek to undermine the, the legalistic approach. Huzzah. Huzzah, that's us, um, who would go poaching. So it's just curious to kind of always think about that salmon sustained many good, bad and indifferent. It did, it, it did. did. And um, actually, it is a neat segue because our good friend Lyrics... Um, he sounds like the type of man who now might be... Clear. I know, sorry, that is probably defamatory. I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm Lyrics. I'm going to keep that in. Um, <laughs> He has some wis- pearls of wisdom to offer in this regard. He talks about um, poaching salmon all the way up to Chapel Lizard from, from kind of Dublin port. Oh, he, he'd, he'd go all the way up to Liffey to Chapel Lizard, which is in kind of northwest Dublin, I suppose. Beautiful little um, little village, if mm. anyone's ever been there. Very, very beautiful spot. But he'd, uh, he'd, he'd, hang, he'd use drift nets, which would hang in, in the water uh, vertically without being anchored to anything. Okay. They just kind of hang, and the salmon uh, become caught in them. But he talks, he talks about slaughtering thousands of them up there. So we'll play this piece from, from Lyrics. Oh, Lyrics. No, you'd never get a sea trout in a trawl. No, but Not a salmon. salmon fishing out here. I don't know a lot of salmon fishing in the, in the river. With drift nets. With drift nets. Uh, I used to fish the drift nets. Yeah. I used to poach more so than nothing else. I was a notorious poacher. <laughs> I went up as far as Chapel Lizard after chasing salmon. <laughs> Oh God, yeah. With a drift net. Yeah, with a drift net. Yeah, brought up the boat in a horse and car, a little small boat, about ten foot. Used to fish out of a house. I arranged with a lady, uh, uh, be the name of Mackie, yeah. and Tim Haley was living on the far oh, side of the river. I know. Yeah. Now, yeah. Tim Haley yeah. was on, lived on. Uh, I fished up there. That's the gospel. <laughs> sure, God. I used to row up at night and fish in the salmon pool. Slaughtered the salmon up there. With the drift net? It w- yeah, at maybe start up about half eleven or twelve o'clock at night, row up from Ring's End, right up into the summer pool at Chapel Lizard. I used to slaughter the salmon up there. You must have had a very small drift net for a pool. Oh, uh, I'd say about 30 yards, yeah. Now, the usual net we fished was 200 yards down Ring's End. But uh, this would be only a little, uh, we used to call them twigs. We call them twigs, a little twig. That'll be about 20. That's all you need for the narrows up there. Ah, Deadly. God. <laughs> Deadly, absolutely. And how many salmon would you get in a good night, though? On your average, anyway? Maybe 20 or 30. Mm. Mm. What sort of size are they? Oh, tell you what, I've got some. Now, the average salmon now in the river, uh, the Liffey, now I say it's about 12 pounds. No. Okay. I haven't got bigger ones up there, but. Uh, that's the average, average yeah. Oh, jeez, I used to slap them up there. It's the only way you get, like, uh, you, you weren't supposed to fish uh, west of the 100 ton crane. That was down as the Northwall extension. Yeah. Uh, if you fished west of that, you were uh, poaching. Or poaching, we call it poaching rings then. But uh, I used to take the chance to pay off anyway. Took a chance. And, uh, Did you ever get sea trout? No one cares about sea trout. Got to take your, your chances yeah, in life. It's amazing. Um, there's another piece which relates to, again, it's our uh, good friend Lyrics describing the process. He's talking about um, fishing in the, I think in the Alexander Basin, which is kind of, basin is a part of Dublin port. It's a kind of, I don't know how to describe it really. You can tell we're not the fishing kind, Johnny. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, moving swiftly on. No, <laughs> we totally not. But in, in the Alexandra Basin, um, Lyrics Murphy is is um, catching his salmon, as he was describing there with the drift nets and so on, um, and a seal eats it. But he, he mentions the fact that on account of this, that he never usually ate salmon. They they, they ate kind of, um, Harry, quote unquote, no. the poor man's fish. You know what I mean? That, they, that the salmon was sold for a high price. Mm. So you'd never eat them. That You'd always sell them. Um, but in this instance... He, he shares one with the seal. And he only, I, I've killed, slaughtered thousands of salmon, not exaggerating, and he only eats salmon once in my life, fresh salmon. Would you believe that? Why, and you, not afford to eat you couldn't afford it. And the reason for that was the seal was after taking a lump out of him. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. And you have with seal. Oh, Lord, I've seen the seal taking two salmon almost down my hand one night. <laughs> he fricking pay. He was after them. He must have been chasing them. Or maybe there was two seals. But as soon as he hit the net, he fricking he took it. I was going for the salmon and he took the blinking 
No, down to the bottom of me. Where, was this far up the river or was it in the estuary? That was in the pond, in Alexander Basin. That happened there. I went and went over to see the seal at me now to eat. Chopping Hell's Gates out. He chops the head off first so that the, the back end will drop out. And when the back end dropped, the, the back end of the salmon drops, he's down after he has it. Very cute. Very clever. Oh, they're clever, yeah. And what seal was that? Was it the grey seal or the, the black seal? Ah, oh, the common grey seal. You, you, you grey seal. Yeah, they're pretty numerous around there. If you come from Lamb Bay Island and yeah. around the Bailey Lighthouse from the caves, you know. And is there any name for him? Well, uh, in Rings End, we call it the sail. The sail? The sail, yeah. The old sail took one on me last night. He always left a trademark. And he'd damage your net too, maybe. We, we smash a few maces of your net. I think he had his belly full that night. He was just <laughs> been working good, though. And uh, there was a big lump out of the salmon anyway. So you couldn't put it on the market. So we cut it up and eat it. It was the only time. I remember ever eating salmon but the people never have any so near slaughtering salmon in their zillions and we should apologize for the father ted pecking and blinking should we i don't think we should chopping hell's gates what an amazing phrase Isn't it? but uh, but he says that despite all the, the amount of that he caught and fished he never ate them mm. and that basically they were sold and they couldn't afford to eat them so you had to sell them but h- hence that just shows the value of the salmon in irish land and the, the markets and the market so on. value um, but there's another nice little piece which i wanted to, to play it relates to the markets these are the the describes the role of the fishermen's wives um, as they would go to the market and in this particular instance uh, Mags Doyle, Mag Doyle from Ring's End in 1980 collected again with the Urban Folklore Project, an amazing project for we have all these these kind of tapes Folklore is urban interviews. as well as rural Absolutely, um, which she's giving an account of the fishermen's wives at the fish market and after a good day and having, having had several uh, halves of porter, they have to get a taxi home basically because they're <laughs> blessed so uh, that's uh, what the skipper's wife had to do. She had to have a hand in it too. She used to go to the market, and then they got too many halves coming home. They come home in a cab. <laughs> if it was a good morning, mm. you know what I mean. I don't know what I say. They say oh, they get well, cause at that time. Sure, a few halves had knocked them. A few less, I suppose, that knocked them off because it was good stuff then. Yeah. But uh, now that was it. That what the fishermen and the wives had to go with them. All skippers' wives. If they was the, if it was the, the skipper was the owner of the trawler, well, his wife would go. But if it was an outsider, they'd have to go, you know. And then we had all the salmon fishing in Rings End. I told you about that. The start in, in uh, it opened in January, but they wouldn't start to fish till February. And there'd be lovely big spring fish. Now, the spring fish, it start, it come around about, about the very end of January, or the, first of February and you'd be getting them and if there was spring fish that was landed and were only eight, seven, eight or nine, well there wouldn't be never seven, say ten to eight pound to say it was going to be a bad season because they were small. Mm. But if you got big spring fish up to twelve or fourteen pound, twenty pound weight, they'd have a good season. And we used to be, I, well, that, well, that's my mother's time. Now that'd be kind of that'd be sold at sixpence a pound and eightpence a pound, tenpence a pound or a shilling a pound. That was all they got for them. And then that they'd fish from them up till the first week of June. And then the pail net to go out. What we call the pail, you call grill now in the market, the small salmon. They'd be from seven pounds, six and a half, seven, and uh, down to five pound weight or four pound weight. Well, they'd be, cu- they'd be getting caught out there in hundreds. And they'd be brought in, they'd be only sold for and sixpence. They got sixpence down to fourpence a pound for them at that time. Mm. There's a woman who knows what she's talked about. There's an entire language, isn't there, to the whole industry. And even the fact that just, you know, kind of the, how the, she talks about the skippers, skippers wives, look, everyone has to do their lot and pull yeah. their bits. It's amazing. It reminds me again of, um, in Singing the Fishing, there's a lovely quote from a woman. She's a Scottish woman, I think. That Singing the Fishing, people should absolutely hunt it down and listen to it. It, it, it. I found it hugely inspiring when I first listened to it. It was one of the things, actually, that got me interested in, in folklore years and years ago. It's all about the fishing communities in the north of England and Scotland. But there's a woman describing, um, I think, around kind of the selling of fish at markets and the mixture of kind of hardship and poverty and work and so on. But she's like, you know, you're never ashamed to be a fisher. No one is ever ashamed to be, to be a fisher. You know, that's, this is what they said. There's a kind of pride in the hard work that goes along with it. Um, but I suppose that 
is some of the practical aspects between the markets, the export, the netting, the technology, the interplay between kind of coastal communities of Britain and Ireland. Um, and to move maybe to some of the, I suppose, the salmon had associations that went beyond the practical concerns and into the more uh, abstract or symbolic or supernatural um, or that involved belief in a sense. And that was kind of touched on by Lyrics Murphy in the last piece of his that we played um, where the, the interviewer at the time asked what was the name for the, the seal? And he said it was called the sail, mm. uh, which touches on a common a common theme, I suppose, in particular with regards um, fishing, where it's taboo. There's a taboo against directly naming um, any particular, the particular fish that, that you're in search, in search of, that it was viewed as being kind of extremely unlucky or fatal in certain instances. Um, so we've quite a bit of material to maybe run through some of the different types of names um, places from not just Ireland but in, in further afield other countries around the North Atlantic um, where there's a taboo against the direct naming of the salmon um, but we go through some of the different names and associations and taboo names and so on that were I think so the fam- the, it's, the, the, the it's salmon such a curious aspect of fishing lore which in itself is hugely broad and rich and it's worth if you are interested to kind of, we'd be happy if you want to get in touch was we have a special edition of Bellages which was dedicated to fishing lore um, Sean O'Hoy, um in the northwest of Ireland in Donegal and I think down into Sligo would have written about um, fishing tradition and lore. Then you've got Barbara's book, you've got oh, a huge amount. Islanders and Water Dwellers, there's new information here, Chris's book, traditional boats. Numerous drawers here in the archive on various aspects, so it's worth um, if you are interested just to kind of get in touch because we can only ever cover a certain amount here. But um, yeah, do you want to go through a few of the names? Well, yeah, I suppose just even to cover the the basic idea, again, when we were talking about popular belief and custom, um, which outside of these hallowed walls would be people would often term as superstitions, Mm -hmm. um, you often find that large amounts of these attend those aspects of human endeavour that have large amounts of risk Mm -hmm. attached to them. And so if you consider uh, the lives of fishermen, and both the danger in which they place themselves daily as they as they kind of traverse the sea and so on and rivers or also the economic um the importance of of i suppose the what do i say the 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 sense of their having to kind of um, succeed economically basically and, and catch as much as they can and how you know at the start of a season as as um Mag, Mag Doyle was explaining you can have a bad season you can have a good season or the fish were sometimes believed to follow a certain person who ever caught the first one, that that person was lucky or likewise unlucky. So ideas of luck and bad luck abound. But on the boat, it was often um, extremely bad luck to mention certain animals, certain professions or types of people, but also certain types of fish. So we have a kind of, I suppose, a listing of some of these um, in parts in, in County Galway. Uh, the salmon was referred to as Mbuchel or Mbuk or Mboyo. Uh, other parts of the country was described as Umbrad. In County Kerry in Kirkachina in the southwest of Ireland, he was called Undine Usel or the Gentleman. Mm. In County Down, um, he was called Cold Iron or Cold Iron Fellow. That's going to be your superhero name, isn't it? That cold Cold Iron yeah. Fellow. I have it emblazoned on a cloak, which I. Um, I'm going to be the Grey Lady the way I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my superpowers are those of, of baldness <laughs> and uh, intense stress. My, my superpowers are. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, the ability to have existential crisis moment to moment. I'm, I'm quite organised, so I think I might just organise criminals into... Neat Little Rose. Absolutely. Amazing, this is going to be the most boring um, <laughs> film ever. Um, to The Gentleman of the Deep, Claire. Sorry. Other sources, The Red Fish by English and Scottish fishermen. This is how he was known, but not called the salmon. Then, um, in the Isle of Man, the Manx language, it was called the East, East Jarrick. Which the lovely thing about the Manx language, it's a strange, when you read it, it's kind of, like you, you'd understand that to be Eisk, Jarrig, as in you red would. fish in the Irish language. But when you see Manx written, it's it's often kind of hard to determine, what what does that mean? But when you pronounce it, yes. you're like, oh right, it's, it's so close it. to Irish, I can understand people speaking Manx. Mm. Um, but when you see it written, it's written in kind of the phonetics of the English language almost. Yeah. Um, but anyway. So in the, in the Manx language, and then by the English and, and Scots, Scot, Scottish fishermen, the redfish. Um, then in the northeast coast, there was a fellow, Reverend Walter Gregor, who said that along most of the coast, the salmon is regarded as fatal, and every village gives him a name. Um, similarly then, 
the salmon and the trout among some of the fishing population were held in great aversion. The word salmon was never pronounced. If there was an occasion to speak of sa salmon, a circumlocution was used, and it was often named after the taxman of the fishings nearest the villages. Um, so the person would say it was so-and-so's, the, the taxman's fish. Sometimes it was called the beast. Sometimes it was known as the beast with the scales or the foul beast. So I suppose there's a huge amount of kind of um, these proxy terms, basically. Even in Norway, for example, there's, there's another, Barbara goes on to describe in, in, in Cold Iron, um, a reluctance to speak of salmon has been noted in Norway. And fishermen's euphemisms there include blank car, blank knapper, the bright fellow, or the tax collector, or the general, and the king. Mm. Um, or it says in, 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 um, in, in Oregon, now in North America, in the Pacific coast, it says that um, you can refer to a salmon as an odd fellow on Braithwaite's rig, or a rabbit, or anything you please, aside from its rightful name. Um, so I suppose the idea is that words have power, that, they, that there's a certain kind of um, an essential force or something, or that by naming something, I don't know, you can kind of tempt it, displease it, anger it, or cause some sort of, um, bring about misfortune, mm. you know, in this sense. And the salmon in particular, it seems to garner a large amount of, of, um, of supernatural association, as much by way of kind of, of, of customs attached to it. True. And actually there was just, there was, um, I found in an article about Japanese fishing lore, they had the exact same thing they see here um, in, in regards to taboo words. The big hunting animals of the woods may be no more called by their real names than may be the big oceanic animals. While using the mountain language, the bear is called master or man of the mountains. And then whales, dolphins and sharks um, and fish such as salmon are styled ibusu in the sea language of fishermen. Mm. Curious, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. It's strange that kind of, but I suppose it, even just the, the sense that um, the, the idea that the salmon is the most kind of noble of the creatures of the deep, and that I, I was reading elsewhere that um, that fishermen would never lie about the salmon. That they, if it, the, the the money that they made from the salmon, they'd never cheat each other out of it. Mm. That if you did, it would bring enormous kind of um, bad luck to you, basically. Um, so that with the salmon, kind of dealings have to be quite fair and transparent in a way that it's not something that you. But that you mess with it, it has these supernatural associations. Mm. Um, it is it's one of the plums of the sea. That's, that's what they say. It. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that struck me as well, um, could we say a quick thing about Barbara? No. No. Moving swiftly <laughs> on. <laughs> yes. Yes. This, this is a daily occurrence, folks. I it hope, is. I hope you understand that he's Care's not the charming um, gentleman that he appears <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> Everyone, everyone out there swooning. I'm like, no, no. Tyrant. The tyrant. Bloody tyrant. Honestly, one day he will be overthrown. <laughs> um, is it worth just saying that Barbara saw the association between um, salmon and the dead? Yes. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a bit of that. Great minds are thinking oh, like your care. I have, I have printed some of that um, material. Oh, we, off we can it. wait to the No, no, go for it. No, no, yeah. Um, just for it, because it just struck me. Um, that the drowned, the salmon has drowned people. Yes. Yeah, very dark. So this idea that salmon or kind of black salmon depending on colouring um, would be associated with the souls of the dead and Barbara has a story here from Glen Colm Kill in County Donegal and mm. um, it's given in its original Irish oh <coughs> sorry I have a frog in my throat um, or is it um, it's not a salmon the, the, rather than the bear no oh, yes. leaving me be, yes. we'll have to touch on that but one night some years ago there was a crew from Glen or from Glen fishing salmon a bit out from this place and when they took the salmon into the boat they came on a big school of salmon, there were 30 in it, they heard the most dog-like crying they ever heard in here at this beach and they got afraid and after a while this crying changed to laughing and they were listening all the time and they thought eventually that it must be people who were drowned in the old days who were there and they rode home as quickly as they could and it got rough and the night changed and all the salmon they got that night they were as black as the devil and they were making out that they were all, all the people who were drowned. Mm. And you see that kind of motif given again. I think I've only seen it in Donegal, but I, I do imagine it appears elsewhere mm. where um, they link it directly with people and give names of those who died in certain areas previously. And then when certain um, unusual aspects of kind of fishing occurrences happen, they, they link the, the fish to those who've gone before. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, kind of the salmon I, and I the dead. They impressed itself on me that, that bit as just a strange, um, I don't know, just the... the, the uh, well, the strange symbol is symbol is more the description of it. Mm. But there are other there's another piece that um, that was mentioned where like that where there's kind of a noise attached to them, so there's laughing and crying and so on, um, but that they were attached to the fairies in some way. 
um, in County Antrim in Glenariff. There's the idea, it says, there was some idea here at the time that the salmon, a certain sort of salmon, had some connection with the wee folks. There's another example, again, of not using the, the fairies yes. in, in tradition. You don't call them the fairies, or you don't say a ghost is a ghost. You say the good people, the gentry, the noble people, or whatever. Um, anyway, it says, I can't recall it clearly, but I seem to have heard it. What I do know is this, I heard this as well, and a Glen Ravel man was telling me about it no later than a few weeks ago. If they're Gindland salmon, that means running your hand under a stone easy and tickling them till you can dab or catch hold of them. If they're doing that in Glen Ravel, even to this day, and the salmon squeals, they'll leave him alone and not catch him. They say he has some connection with something or other. So there's this idea that, that they're kind of um, connected in some way to the world of the supernatural, which makes sense when we look at the, the early literature and all. One of the, one of the most common ideas for among Irish people I'd say would be the idea of the salmon of knowledge yes. a lot of people even the school children would be familiar with the story of Fionn McCool Ireland's kind of hero mythic hero mythic champion and seer poet figure um, who, who eats the salmon of knowledge mm-hmm. and in eating the salmon of knowledge gains the gains this kind of supernatural omniscience of the cosmos basically mm-hmm. so where do we even start with all this I suppose the well when we say eating the salmon of knowledge yes. it's, it's the sucking of the thumb yeah, well, yeah. So there, there's, um, there's an old seer, druid chap, um, and he's trying to catch the salmon of knowledge. The salmon of knowledge lives in Cundas Well, and Cundas Well. We'll look at descriptions of that later on, maybe as well. In the nineteenth century, there are fantastic um, descriptions of it by people like Yeats and George Russell and these kind of um, occultist, occultist, mystic poet types, um, but. Fionn catches the salmon, sorry, the salmon has been caught by mm-hmm. this, this um, Fionn 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 is the is the old, um, ah. the old druid fellow. The young hero Fionn catches the salmon. The old chap says to him to watch it while it cooks. Um, Fionn agrees to do this, but he said not to eat it under any circumstances. A blister arises on the skin of the salmon. Mm-hmm. Fionn extinguishes the blister, he bursts it with his thumb. He burns his thumb, puts his thumb in his mouth, and by doing so, accidentally kind of... Um, gains the power that that this chap had 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 been um hoping to to receive himself basically um but one of the one of the the kind of the treatments of this topic is from thomas o'rahley's early irish history and mythology which is a bit of a tome it's it's an amazing book wonderful yeah um just here being dragged across the table here and he talks about the wisdom of finn and the source of wisdom and he talks about the idea of the other world as being this source of wisdom, basically, mm-hmm. and how it becomes kind of embodied in the salmon. So, in this text, 1946, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies published this. Um, an amazing institute set up by De Valera um, to study early Irish literature and a kind of school of, of, of astrophysics mm-hmm. combined together. And they do this amazing, bizarre kind of work. Um, so, it says here, in Celtic belief, the other world was the source of all wisdom, and especially of that occult wisdom to which humanity could not, except in very limited degree, attain. Uh, one of the characteristics of the god of the other world was his omniscience. Then he goes on to say, this other world deity was polymorphic. He was often regarded as possessing or assuming animal shape, for example, as a horse or a, as a bull or as a wolf. As he could fly through the air, he might be conceived of as a great bird. Similarly, when the other world was conceived as situated beneath the sea or a lake, the appropriate shape which the god would assume as a denizen of the waters would be that of a salmon. So, from his omniscience, the deity in salmon form was known as the old fish, the salmon of wisdom. And one of the locations of this wise salmon was at, was at S. Ruid, Ruid's waterfall, the falls of Asaro in, at the, on the Erne in, in, in Ballyshannon. Um, so, he ca- carries on to talk about the salmon of wisdom, being associated with the river Boyne, over which the god Nuidu, otherwise known as Nachtan, presided. So, when he he basically there there's the there's this other world deity Nuidu who is associated with the Boyne, but there's also the god Nodens, and Nodens there's a temple to to the god Nodens in in uh, in Lydney Lydney Park on the Severn in Britain, mm-hmm. and it's an old kind of Roman temple. I've seen pictures of it, and there are these lovely mosaic tiles that that remain in in, in the ruins. And in these kind of um, mosaic on, on the remains of this this temple, to Nodens, there's a, there's um, a representation of him in which he has a triton with an anchor in one of his hands, and opposite him a fisherman in the act of hooking a salmon. So, I suppose the idea here that that O'Rahley says, with this we may compare the fisherman who, in the story of Finn's acquisition of wisdom, catches the divine salmon and gives it to Finn to cook. 
If the comparison is justified, we may take it that the fisherman and the salmon in the Lydney Park effigy both represent the god uh, Nodens. So, I suppose there's the idea that uh, the omniscience of the other world deity is anthropomorphized and finds representation as some animal that goes to the sky or goes to the water, mm. and that the individual who partakes of that animal, who eats it or consumes it in some way, then gains the omniscient occult knowledge of that deity, which is kind of mediated through nature. They, they then access it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and the idea being, I suppose, that O'Reilly suggests that that um, he connects Nuada to Gol, Gol McMorna, who is who's Fionn's kind of sworn enemy. They're always vying with one another for leadership of the Fianna, the warriors that they that, that Fionn leads. Um, but he sees Fionn as a version of, of Lu, this mythic hero, whose father, Balor, is also this one-eyed kind of tyrant, basically. So he, he draws all these kind of parallels. He also just drops in these hilarious little things, like um, he'll name drop some person and talk about, like, for further information on this article, see this, but it's actually totally useless, devoid of any, of any worth. Men this, are very this bitter, is aren't they? Ex- they're an extremely bitter lot, but not they as are. bitter as women, Claire. <laughs> now, moving swiftly on. Um, so what, I suppose what he's suggesting is that, that the deity finds representation as an animal. And that there is a history in in Irish tradition and in British tradition. There was a there was a salmon of knowledge who lived in in the Severn River in Britain, and so you have the deity, the creature, and they're both one and the same. So Fionn eats of the the salmon mm-hmm. basically, and then he gains this this supernatural knowledge. Um, but in did did you hear the the the, uh, the the thumb and the kind of chewing of his thumb is how he gains this knowledge? Yes, and. O'Rahilly talks about old um, druidic practices in, that were used to gain prophecy, prophecy yes. knowledge. The Imbus, Imbus Frusni. Dio Hogan speaks about this too. Yeah, where, where the practice was to chew the raw flesh of a pig mm. um, or some other animal and then to kind of make incantations over, to offer it to the deity um, and to then uh, to sleep. And when you'd sleep, that this wisdom would come to you, basically. One of the things that um just in that same vein that struck me in terms of etymology was um Dahio Hogan when speaking about the hero traits of Finn, mm. he looks at the words used to measure um, meat in the past that you could get mere and ordag. Yes, yeah, which, yeah. And in Irish, like mare is finger, finger ordag is thumb. Yeah. And he kind of he wonders whether there was a certain um crossover between the chewing of flesh and then someone misreading the word mere as in just like a morsel of meat. Mm. to mean mare finger mm. or, or that thumb it's, um, I have no definitive answers but isn't it just um, it's, it's amazing fascinating it's, it to is. Think about these little he, he talks about um, or how he talks about the banning of this practice of Imbus Frosny by St. Patrick as it could make these in, invocations to demons as he, as he said but I mean um, he also talks about uh, the bull feast or the bull sleep where hides of, of bulls were left in the hill and the person wrapped themselves in it You've and, told me about this and yeah. slept and then they'd have this this knowledge imparted to them whatever but it seems that the idea of kind of chewing with a view chewing flesh offering it to the deity so then the deity i suppose becomes um perhaps symbolically understood to embody the the animal or whatever um and that when you sleep then having made this offering the wisdom will be will be um granted to you basically so there's a motif i guess that fits in with the 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 kind of occult or esoteric or whatever arcane practices um, in this sense, that then become part of of the the attributes mm-hmm. of heroic Fionn as a seer figure who has this access to this kind of knowledge. Um, but apart from the attribute of the kind of the, the and in some instances it's obviously it's not just sucking his thumb, but it's he chews it to the bone. Yes. It's, yeah. In fact, I have um, from Dunar of Finn, from the Irish Text Society, I have a little a short well, it's actually quite long. We'll just read a short bit out of it, where. It's talking about Fionn's prophecy. And again, this all having been granted to him by the Salmon of Knowledge, um, where he sees basically the, the ruin of, of Ireland coming. And he says, Oshin, who's Fionn's son, canst thou tell us something of the prophecy of the son of Cool? Did the prosperous king predict that angels truly, and then dot, 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 the text is unknown. Um, I shall tell thee a clear tale of hardship, great Patrick, son of Copernicus. This is from the Colloquy of the Elders, where mm. Patrick and Oshin meet. And the kind of the Christian order and the pagan order kind of ramble around Ireland together, and every event I am predicting will be torment to thy heart. Uh, once Fionn took a seat in the east above the glen at Fresh Ben Aether, which is Howth in North County Dublin, when he saw a thick cloud coming from the north, covering Ireland in an instant. 
Those nearest the king, son of Cool of Alwyn, were myself and Dread Oscar and Creolta, son of Ronan. I first speak, battle honour to Great Fionn, High Prince of Alwyn. What is that dark cloud from the north which has covered Ireland in an instant? Then, dear Creolta, said to the son of Cool of Alwyn, Put thy thumb beneath thy tooth of knowledge, and leave us not in ignorance. Um, it is woe, dear Creolta, Fionn says. The prophecy lies in the distant future. The banner crossing the Mervian will force their wickedness on the men of Ireland. They will destroy all Ireland, both cultivated, plain, and break for two hundred full years. That will be Ireland's fate. He goes on in such a cheery mode for the next few stanzas. But he's describing the Danner or the Danes, the arrival mm-hmm. of the Norse men and the Norse people to Ireland. Um, which is interesting, actually, I suppose, even in the context of Fionn describing the, the, the Danes and the Norse and so on. Because Dahi um, takes, he, 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 he connects the idea of the salmon of knowledge. Uh, and eating of the salmon to gain this kind of this omniscient knowledge as being a borrowing from that of Sigurd the Volsung in the old Icelandic tradition where Sigurd eats uh, the dragon Fafnir's heart mm-hmm. and then he has the lang- he can understand the language of, of the animals and then realises that somebody's plotting uh, treachery against him basically and so Dahi suggests that the Irish borrowed the, the motif um, of that that's present in the Icelandic of, of Sigurd eating the, the heart, of Fafnir's heart he says um, the Gaels adopted it and, and adapted the folktale from the Norse since they saw it as being suitable to the image of Fionn's mystical thumb this would presumably have occurred um, when the Norse influence on the Gaelic world was at its zenith around the 10th century so I suppose Fionn and Sigurd Siegfried and so on and, and, uh, and these kind of figures have a certain connection of these heroic um, champions, mythic champions, and so on. But that motif of the the eating of uh, a kind of the creature or the heart or whatever, and then gaining all this knowledge, has a much wider derivation in an older Indo-European motif, where where an individual eats a white serpent, mm. um, and that was collected in Germany and Serbia, all over all over Europe. And in eating the serpent, they gained the knowledge of the animals. Who often then there's a story say the individual who is kind to the animals when he can hear their plight like he doesn't tread on these ants that are moving underfoot or he feeds some hungry crows or um, he what does he do uh, he he puts some fish back in water and so on and, he, and they all come back and thank him later and save him and he gets to marry the princess all the sort of the kind of typical hero tale or whatever but uh, it links it back into the older Indo-European motif so you have this this huge tapestry, this stretch from India to Ireland where you have these folk tales moving across and motifs that kind of float within them, I suppose. Mm. And we can place this, the the, the idea, I suppose, that, that the omniscient knowledge, some sort of cosmic kind of knowledge, is found by um, the hero, the seer, who eats of some sort of divine manifestation of, the, of a deity, of a god or whatever. Mm. If that makes the remotest bit of sense. No, it does. It kind of ties in with something I read actually about um, the story of the hawk of Achill, where the old t- old timeless bird. Yes, yeah. and it's that idea that um, the humans could transform into animals, and that these would carry the history of the world mm. um, within them. Yeah, and so and that's exactly what you're seeing. The, really, the, just the this hawk knowledge of and this the, wisdom. Was that 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 uh, this was the old bird who knew who could kind of tell all of Ireland's history, mm. and. The the even I mean, the salmon features as well, in um in the Ulster cycle, Cú Chulainn, Cú Rí, this figure who can only be killed when you first kill um a little salmon that lives in the river, that houses his soul, and when you kill the salmon, then you can kill his body, and then mm. he's properly dead. But otherwise, you can't kill him. It's the life token or soul index is external, and it's in this little salmon that's that's swimming around. Um, and that's in the Ulster cycle. But did you you mentioned yesterday the Brad on the Vahat that we found in oh. of, of Boo's material? This the the idea that that yes. the life the life force of the individual is understood as a little salmon that lives in the body. It is. It's very curious now. Um. So essentially, Boo Alchemist Professor Boo Alchemist, who was the head of the department here, um, and who sadly passed away. He has um numerous numerous tales that he's transcribed over the years but one of them is Brad and the Beha which is from Kerry and he's basically told the story of two men who go to a wake one eats um, a huge amount when offered and the other one doesn't like to eat in the presence of ladies so um, refuses the bread and then as they're walking home he kind of takes some kind of turn doesn't he and essentially a, a salmon 
appears from his mouth comes out, of, comes out. which is like the Guntram legend the, the butterfly yes, it's, exactly. it's the same idea sorry yeah no no you're quite right and um, so the salmon literally comes out of him the other gentleman fearing that this is his life force and that he is dying takes the salmon goes back to the um wake house asks for some minuit or um kind of meal um pedanta, what's that made from that, that grain Indian meal stuff. Exactly, yeah, I think yeah, it is yeah, Indian meal. Yeah. We only call it Minui at home. I don't know what it's. Um, but essentially, asks for some of that, puts it in a handkerchief with the salmon, goes back and feeds it back to the um the the, the dying man, which reminds me of that bird yesterday that we were saw. But that's scraggy that, magpie. Yes, that's not. Yeah, the, he, the he podcast. wasn't the best looking. No, so um feeds it back to the gentleman and he is restored. And it's mm. this idea that every human being has this life force within them that manifests itself as a salmon or brother on the behe. And in Boo's transcription of the story, interestingly, the informant who's giving the story says that only men have it, mm -hmm. that women don't have it. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never known there to be a dichotomy. I, whenever I have kind of rarely heard about it, it's always been that every human has it. So I was never aware of this dichotomy between um, kind of men, male and female. Male and female, because I've always heard that the brat and the behe exists for all humans. And essentially, it's this, as I said, life force, and he describes it as if any kind of strain is put on the person or at the moment of death that this life force leaves them mm. in, in the form of the brat and the beha and that you can see it almost ticking away beneath the skin which really kind of came mm. home to me um, when I visited someone in hospital where when the skin you can almost see the pulse mm. just flickering beneath the skin mm -hmm. and that kind of just image came to my head mm. brat and the beha which um, is kind of, it's it's nice to think about and you hope that it doesn't depart anyone mm. kind of prematurely. But yeah, there's this idea that the life force in a human is rather than the beha. Or it's also, yes, the beha. it's a profound kind of, those little, um, the, I don't know, there's a, a kind of beautiful artistry to those, not quite, what would you, kind of embodying the pulse, the life force as this active creature, yes. you know? Um, so um, I Personally, we would just finish up on something I found that I had not been aware of, but the younger Claire at the age of 10, when I wanted to be an explorer, oh. would have loved this. So it's the idea of the measurement of time by the lifespan of various animals. And I have found something that links ancient Greek tradition to a kind of rarely told tale um, from kind of almost modern day Ireland as collected by Douglas Hyde um, within our own mm -hmm generational memory Context, yeah. so essentially what it is is the the measurement of time by the the lives of animals so in westminster abbey there is a certain plaque that lays down um a kind of a latin verse and it says if i can find it here do, 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 um, so it reads if the reader considers prudently all that is set down here, he will find the end of the prima mobile. The boundary is threefold. You add dogs, horses and men, stags and ravens, eagles and huge whales. Whatever follows multiplies by three the years of the passing earth. The spherical globe shows the archetypal microcosm. Amazing. And essentially what it does is it gives each animal uh, a lifespan and then you have to work it out. So it's this little verbal riddle. Hmm. And this has been seen in Greek tradition, Latin tradition, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Breton, German. And it also comes down to kind of our own Irish tradition to give you a sample of a German tradition so that you can kind of hear what it sounds like. Not in German now, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, a town lasts three years. A dog outlasts three towns. A horse outlasts three dogs. Man outlives three horses. An ass outlives three men. A wild goose outlives three asses. And on and on it goes. Hmm. And then if we compare that to um, an Irish version, you've got the Book of Lismore. We have something very um, similar, which reads, A year for the stake, three years for the field, three lifetimes of the field for the hound, hmm. three lifetimes of the hound for the horse, three lifetimes of the horse for the human being, three lifetimes of the human being for the stag, three lifetimes of the stag for the ousel, which is a bird, um, three lifetimes of the ousel for the eagle, three lifetimes of the eagle for the salmon, three lifetimes of the salmon for the ewe, three lifetimes of the ewe for the world from its beginning to its end. Mm. And thereby you figure out how long the world will last before mm. Armageddon appears. Nice. Which someone has kindly worked out and they've taken that 
it's 59,050 years. Hmm. This reminds me of, of something I'd mentioned yesterday about the, the salmon and Raj and the, the, the fact of the, the idea that the salmon dwelt in a hidden well, a supernatural well, mm-hmm. and that the, the, the salmon received its wisdom from nine, nine hazelnut trees that grew around the well and then hazelnuts dropped into the, to the waters uh, and the salmon partook of the hazelnuts, ate them and then gained all this wisdom. Mm-hmm. There's a little poem, a little piece here um, and George William Russell, A.E., describes, he says, uh, a cabin on the mountainside hid in a grassy nook where door and windows open wide the friendly stars may look. The rabbit shy can patter in, the winds may enter free who throng around the mountain throne in living ecstasy. And when the sun sets dimmed in eve and purple fills the air, I think the sacred hazel tree is dropping berries there. From starry fruitage waved aloft where comes well or flows, for sure the enchanted waters run through every wind that blows. I think when night tears up aloft and shakes the trembling dew, how every high and lonely thought that thrills my being through is but a ruddy berry dropped down through the purple air, and from the magic tree of life the fruit falls everywhere. She was talking about this hidden well of knowledge which we should endeavour to search for in our waking lives but it's curious I read an article about um, wells and rivers and lakes being kind of a source of potent power mm. in early yeah. literature for the acquisition of wisdom and knowledge mm. so um, whenever you see that in, in tales that you're reading everything's there for a reason so if you come across water mm-hmm. particularly fire those kind of symbols and mm. um, you know, think about what they represent mm-hmm. um, shall we Shall we? Let's, we shall. Let's. We should be more like the salmon. <laughs> should um, we? Yes, we should. Striving, endeavouring nobly against the currents of our time to return to the source of all knowledge. To be consumed by... Not full of fatty omega oils. Plastics. Necessarily. <sighs> no. That's another project. Returning to the well from which all knowledge springs. That is our... That should be our aim. We should leave it there, I Yes, suppose. we should. I think we've probably lost a few... I think we yeah, lost a few yeah. on the way there, Claire, not going to lie. Yeah. Uh, but that was a great pleasure to be back again. And then um, next month, with some sort of other unintelligible topic, we shall return. Indeed. And the Sudogin may slanthen Radhanya Gavali Kharja. Dear Agus, well, Slanagi. See you next month. Indeed. Bye.